Like literally, it's a race because every day that passes that an agency is not taking steps towards providing supplementary, regular, weekly jujitsu practice is a day that a viral video can happen on that department's name or another excessive force lawsuit can happen. This is the most exciting change to policing in the last 150 years. Yo, what's going on? Welcome to another episode of the It's Needed Podcast, where we discuss real issues involving law enforcement in the community. It's your boy, Ryan Tillman, founder of Breaking Bears United, and I am joined by the light-skinned wonder himself, Mr. Oh No, It's the Popo. What's going on, AJ? I can't call it. What's the word, brother? Oh, say I should have worn my I can't call it shirt today. <laughs> as soon as I said that, I thought that. Like, I had to look at you like, you don't got the shirt on, does he? Okay, we're, we're good to go. Oh, man. Is there is there a way for AJ to join on live too, Henner? Do you know or no? With three, I, don't I think have no idea, you guys. Yep. I'm just a white belt over here trying to enjoy the party. <laughs> oh man! So we are we are also joined uh, by Mr. Henner Gracie himself. What's going on, Henner? How you doing, my man? I'm excellent, man. Stoked to be here. A little early for me on a Monday, but you know I got to sneak away before the kids went out to school. So. Happy to be here with you guys. So uh, thanks for doing that, Henner. And again, it's a pleasure being back with you guys. Um, you know, it's there's a lot going on in the world, and I've been following Henner and what he's <laughs> doing for since the last time. And man, you have been doing some phenomenal work, bro. Like I, to say the least, man, I just commend you. Um, if you guys haven't listened to episode, the first episode we had with Henner, go back and check it out. And so the reason I wanted to bring Henner back on today was simply because I wanted to catch up and see what you've been up to since the last time we talked because you've been busy. And so uh, let's just jump right into it. What, what's going on? So, yeah, I feel like the first time we got together and, uh, you know, the first podcast we did together is really all about why jujitsu for law enforcement, right? Why, you know, what? Yeah, really the, the, the nature of jujitsu for those who kind of aren't educated in terms of the benefits of jujitsu for law enforcement. Well, since that happened, we now have data of a department in Georgia, Marietta Police Department, that has been revealed, a department that has been really uh, supplementing uh, regular, you know, eight hours a year, the regular annual in-service training requirement. They've been supplementing that with jiu-jitsu in a very unique way, one that we've been proposing for a long time, and they've been effective with it. And now we have nearly two years of data um, showing what has happened to Marietta Police Department uh, on the other side of making jujitsu mandatory for rookies. So all new hires mm. are getting uh, jujitsu during their police academy. And then it was so successful that they've now opened this up to all in service. So the department is sponsoring off duty and in some cases on duty for certain officers, but really off duty supplementary regular jujitsu practice for all officers at the Marietta police department. Nice. And this is taking place at a civilian jujitsu school, a carefully vetted civilian owned and operated Brazilian jujitsu school in Marietta, Georgia. So this is the, really the first, uh, the first of its kind. And it's the first time we have data to show how are officers performing differently on the other side of making jujitsu part of their regular weekly training regimen uh even though it's not happening at the department on the watch of a defensive tactics instructor this is a separate Man. situation and i want to just discuss what that data is kind of how they got the party started over there um the man in charge of the whole thing over there is major jay king who is is, is a close friend of mine and has been certified in our program gst gracie survival tactics for many years the department has been working with us for 11 years since 2009 but it took them several years to realize the need to take it to the next level. Even though we've been barking this for so long, so loudly, uh, it wasn't until two years ago when a video went viral in Marietta of four officers trying to control one suspect there in like a fast restaurant. Um, it didn't look good. They were holding him down. They were striking him, right? The typical, um, these cops don't know what they're doing and it's a disaster on camera and the video goes viral for all these reasons. And they sat down, instead of kind of fighting the virility of it, they sat down and asked the question of, wait a minute, how are we going to expect our officers to do anything different when we don't give them the tools to do mm. anything differently? Yep. Like, that's the conclusion. So it was a very, uh, an exceptional level of leadership in Marietta that, that caused them to sit back and say, wait a minute, 
these cops don't choose their training. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and so and that's what I, I love that. And before you get so before you get to the data, I want to highlight something because you said something that was critical. And we talked about this at my department, AJ. Uh, I'm sure you can relate to it. But we've all seen those videos before where police officers, they just seem like they're meleeing on somebody. And, you know, some police departments will call them distraction strikes. Well, my department, they've done a phenomenal job is identifying problems and trying to correct those problems whenever we can. And so one of the things that got brought up is what is even a freaking distraction strike? Like, and we really, nobody could define it, but we, but we would always say, oh, I delivered some distraction strikes in order to get his hand out, but nobody really knew what a distraction strike was. So we do have guys at our department and stuff like that have, that have been training, especially with the, the Gracie family and things like that. And so we said, you know what, we need to go back and look at how can we accomplish the goal without having to deliver deliver all of these you know punches to the head or whatever it is because we're really not accomplishing anything and we see the videos over and over again so to the public it almost looks like oh this is police brutality these guys are just meleeing on this dude but in in hindsight looking at those guys what they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out how to get this guy's arms from underneath them and get him in control but there's better ways to do it and a lot of those better ways are ways that you guys have already created through uh, jiu-jitsu in order to get access to those arms and put them into custody. And not only that, it looks better on camera. It looks way better because, oh, you, way better. you know, uh, the other day I just had a, I had a foot pursuit the other day and I ended up tackling the guy. And as opposed to like striking this dude, you know, you know, hundreds of times, what I do is, you know, we, we have leverage on him and now we're able to control him and get his arms behind his back even though he was resisting uh and put him in handcuffs which looks so much better on camera so i want to ask you henner what are some things that you've learned because you haven't all i mean you've always worked with law enforcement i'm assuming but over the last few years you've probably been doing a deep dive into law enforcement our practices and things like that so what are some of the things that you've learned throughout your journey first of all i've learned that you're right there's no distraction strikes right like to me distraction strike is a is a PR friendly name for the, I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> and I'm desperate right now and I'm experiencing an amygdala hijack and I'm panicking and I don't have a less, um, less violent way to pull this person's hands out in a more efficient way. So I'm going to use what the department labels a distraction strike. That's what that is. Distraction strike is that I don't know what I'm doing strike. So you know, I'm going to take someone down. I'm going to control them. I'm going to neutralize the situation. And I'm not saying strikes don't have their place, right? Like, let's not blanket this one way or the other. But I'm saying, yes, in 99% of the time, we see an officer striking someone. I just released the incident from the New York City subway incident the other day um, of the cops take the guy down. Uh, same thing, four cops holding him. One guy's just punching him in the face because they mm -hmm. couldn't get this guy prone and cuff him. And he was an older man, you know, in the subway there who probably just jumped a little subway turnstile. So, and he's just boom, boom. And there's no nowhere in the world does this look good. So listen, what I've learned is that, you know, an untrained officer is an accident waiting to happen. Mm. And another way to say that is an untrained officer is a viral video waiting to mm. happen. Mm -hmm. So each department is now in a position where they have to make choices. They have to decide, are they going to wait for the viral video, right? Or the excessive use of force, or at least the blatantly, um, you know, unacceptable use of force to the public, because sometimes what is unacceptable to the public was necessary use of force, especially considering the limited training provided these officers. So I look at this and I go, man, I feel bad for the public and that civilian. I also feel bad for that officer because they don't know what the heck they're doing. And I also feel bad for the department because they're stuck politically and <laughs> without making any changes that are necessary. So everyone's trapped. And I'm over here like, dude, <laughs> we have a huge part of the answer, which is just give them better skills with regular frequency weekly, one hour per week, every officer in America. That's what I'm fighting for. And I won't stop till I drop. So give them regular training, one hour per week, basic grappling control so that the amygdala hijack this idea that your brain is taken over. Your conscious prefrontal cortex is taken over by your lizard brain, fight, flight, freeze, you know, survival mode, fear mentality, so that that amygdala hijack, you guys, it takes more from the situation to cause that amygdala hijack. When you're better trained, the threshold of chaos that is necessary to cause you to lose your cool is much higher. 
So your boiling point is much higher mm -hmm. than someone who has no skills and they boil in the first 10 seconds of an altercation when someone just rips their arm away from an arrest. All of a sudden the amygdala hijack kicks in and we don't know what happens when it comes to use of force. There's no predictability. Even the best cop in the world becomes the liability to themselves, their department and the community the minute the amygdala hijack takes place. And the amygdala hijack is simply a function of how prepared are you to handle the stress of this uncontrollable situation? That's it, that's all it is. So more training, you increase the boiling point, you have better cops, lower liability for everyone, and this department data proves it finally, which is why we're so excited to be here. I, I was just gonna ask about that. So in Marietta, Georgia, is that what they have been doing is setting an hour aside a week or what has their time? Tell you what like? they've been doing, bro. That's why we woke up early before breakfast here. That's right. So here's the deal. It's crazy what happened. So let me just give you the timeline. And this is the, this is the downloadable PDF with the data. So on April 1st, 2019, Marietta PD, right, Institute of Training Program makes BJ, weekly BJJ, mandatory for these uh, new, new hire in service, uh, new hire officers, right, they're recruits. So they, I think they're five months in the academy. They have to go one week per, uh, one class per week for the entire academy. That's mandatory. They get their jujitsu gi, they go to the lieutenant's office there or the major's office, they get their uniform and they show up at the class and they train for five months straight. Right. What they noticed, this was the word on their exit survey after the academy, the number one word Major King reported was confidence. Mm. These recruits left the academy more confident than any other recruit class in history. So they enter into the field having trained in some cases, you know, 100 classes or more. They were allowed to do more than one class a week, but the once a week was mandatory. So they became jujitsu students at a civilian owned school in the community. They're going to regular jujitsu classes. They're practicing with civilians. So the community benefit of being around other civilians while learning this valuable skill, all the benefits you could imagine were happen. And then what happens is they have videos of actual force incidents of these recruits engaging once they're out in the field. And it's like violent you know, situation or a mental patient attacking them in a situation where certainly you want to use the minimal level of force, duck under, body full takedown, full mount, take the back, and they're holding the guy down, not a punch thrown, no profanity, wow. like calm, deliberate control. And then at the end, they're just patting the guy on the back like, yo, we're going to be okay, <laughs> champ. We got you from here. Everything's going to be fine. So this type of community, and then what happened on that particular incident, which is actually on our website, I'll send you the link later. What happened in that incident, he takes the suspect down, this mental patient, takes him down, controls him, and the sergeant who was there, I guess there was the FTO or whoever was there in charge of the situation was like, yo, that was the nicest takedown, told the, the recruit, the new, like, the new hire, that was the nicest takedown I've ever seen. And the recruit says, oh, don't worry, I've done that a hundred times. Oh, nice. So Man. it's normal. So it's so successful, you guys, this program was so successful for the recruits that after about almost 12 months of this program, I think it was just over 12 months of multiple classes coming through, the Major King and the command staff, the chief there in Marietta, they're, now they're like, yo, this, for the recruits, it couldn't have been better. They're like, well, what if we open this up to in-service? So now they opened it up and they told all in-service officers, we're gonna sponsor your training. We're gonna pay for your training. You get to go to this local jujitsu school, train any classes you want, and we're gonna sponsor them. So then what happened is the first month it was like 46, 55, 61, 62, and what happens is it got so successful that officers who were doing this civilian on off-duty practice started talking about it to the other officers. Like, yo, it's awesome, you gotta go, we're learning, there's a camaraderie there, you get to make friends, you're having a great time. It was a very communal thing that started happening. So it wasn't the department saying you have to go, it was look, this is amazing that we're getting this paid for by our department, mm, this is a gift yeah. to us. And all the confidence, and then of course, those officers who went, having the videos start to stack up, dash cam, body cam, all of this evidence of successful deployment of these tactics. And by this tactics, all we mean is less force, less violence, less chaos, less punching in the head, no virility in their videos. Like boring, unremarkable <laughs> arrests. How crazy is it that unremarkable arrest footage yeah. is remarkable these days? Yeah, exactly. How crazy yeah. is that? So. That's what's wild. These guys are taking them down, controlling the situation. So all the officers are now opened up. You guys can go train whenever you want. We're going to sponsor it, right? And of course, when we talk, and then they opened it up, you guys. They opened it up. And the data speaks for itself. To date, 95 of the 145 officers in Marietta. So not all, 
95 officers have opted into this training, still about 50 who have not. So not only in one sense, we want all of them to do it. But in the other sense, this gives us a great comparison study because mm -hmm. we have a control group of officers who are not supplementary trained with yep. jujitsu on yep. off duty basis on a weekly basis. So now they have the data. So first question is regarding injuries in jujitsu practice, because they're going to class. You guarantee that every command staff is going to say, wait a minute, how injured many times are these guys getting injured grappling every week? Yep. Right. On, on, on training that we're paying for. So number one, 2,600 classes have been taken in just over 18 months of this program's deployment, 26, almost two years, 2,600 total classes by officers in Marietta, one reported injury wow. in two years. That's one, crazy. It was a cracked nose on a takedown when they were rolling around. That's an easy one fix. reported injury, you guys. So injury in the training environment is a non-concern. So let's go to the next block of data. In the 18 months prior to the to implementation of this sponsored Marietta PD sponsored jujitsu opportunity, in the time prior to that, 18 months, they had, and I'm reading it here, so we got to make sure it's <laughs> right. In the 18 months prior, 29 officers were injured in use of force encounters in the field. 29 injuries. In the 18 months after the implementation of the program, 15 officers were injured in the same amount of time, only 15 injured officers. Here's what's wild. That's a 48% reduction in officer injury department wide. Wow. For the whole department, we've had 40% less injuries in the same span of time, 48% less injuries. It gets crazier, you guys. Of the 48% of those injuries, those 15 injuries that were reported, zero of them were from the BJJ population. Wow. <laughs> well, mind blown. Mind blown. But you know what's beautiful about that is during the exit survey, when they put that they were more confident, something that I have learned like over my years is control and confidence go hand in hand. You see like a lot of these incidents that are just out of control. And there's like crazy punches being thrown. It's like their lack of confidence. It is what's causing that. So it's, it's exciting to see a command staff somewhere step up and see the benefits behind this. And it's even Absolutely. more exciting to have it on paper to show command staff now. It's so now, Exactly. And that's what's exciting now. But here's what's wild. The risk that Marietta had to take yes. to be the first one through the gate. Yep. The first one through the gate is always the one at the highest risk of getting shot. Yeah. So the risk that Marietta took by saying, yo, we're going to do this. Like, this will never be undone, you guys. The future right. of policing be begins with Marietta mm -hmm. because they now have the golden data that makes it less risky for every... I'm talking to LAPD. We have inquiries coming in from all over the wor world now from departments who've now been exposed to this data, and they're just like, they're completely at a loss. They don't know where to start. They're like, holy, this changes everything what they thought. Yep. They always thought of, oh, training is such a liability because we, people get hurt. Well, no wonder they get hurt. You're doing eight hours a year yep. and they haven't gone to the gym the entire year. Yep. Then you bring them in for eight hours of DTAC in one day and to, just to <laughs> check the box of the annual yep. in-service requirement. Exactly. And of course they get hurt. So they're using that logic to say, oh, because DTAC is so dangerous, let's just do it once a year to check the state required mandate and then let's get out of the way. It's the opposite. The reason DTAC is so dangerous is because you do so little of it. Mm -hmm. So Marietta exposed, and here's what's wild. The attitude in the beginning was like, yo, these new hires, they're just, they're just new recruits. We can, and this is what Jake said verbatim. He's like, yo, we can pretty much do anything we want with them. <laughs> like that was his, yeah. that was his exact yeah. quote. Like, I have it on video. He was like, we can do whatever we want. So it was almost like a little test. Just send For them sure. to jujitsu and let's just see what happens because the risk, all the fears surrounding injuries and in-service, and these things, they're not fully hired yet, so it's a little sketchy. So the point is, they just <laughs> sent him. I don't care what, whatever they had to do to get that approved, it worked, and then it was so successful that it climbed up the ladder. So 48% reduction, you guys. In terms of injuries, they did the math, and even though the BJJ population had no injuries in that population, at least in that window, the 48% reduction to the department overall, it led to a reduction in workers' comp hmm. spending. 
So they saved on average about four thousand eight hundred per claim. They did the math. It's sixty seven thousand dollars in workers comp savings for the city and for the for the department in the reduction of those injuries to officers alone. Forget the I'm going to tell you about the suspect injuries reduction. I was going to say the lawsuit because how much money did it save in lawsuits? The from, lawsuits are separate. You exactly. Guys, the lawsuits that's, are hundreds that's more of money thousands of dollars. Those are on top of this. I'm talking like, because here, I'm talking to the police chiefs right now. I'll talk to the communities of America mm-hmm. in a second. I'm just talking to command staff saying, look, even if you don't care about preventing lawsuits, care about saving money on workers' comp claims that you will spend when you have clumsy, out of shape, undertrained officers who get into a little scuffle and then fall down awkwardly because they've never fallen horizontally for the last two years. <laughs> so when they go vertical to horizontal, they're a flopping fish, right? Get that officer trained so that they aren't a liability for your department financially. Just from the money perspective, it's better for the department. So this is what's so powerful is that you might say, oh, I don't care about jujitsu or I'm, I'm team this or I'm team... The numbers don't lie. If you're going to save $67,000 in a small, medium-sized department, 150 officers, you know what I'm saying? Imagine when you have 2,000, 3,000, or even 20 officers. And not only that, that, Henner, it's, you know, we talk about, because one of the things is going to come up, well, how much does it cost? How much does it cost? That's the main thing. That's where the rubber meets the road. How much does it cost? But what you're saying right now is if you reduce the amount of injuries, if you... uh, train your officers so that way when they go out and use force and they're not using excessive force because we we can all agree i'm sure that a lot of the excessive force complaints come out of not officers doing anything that was unethical but more so they were untrained and therefore they're beating a guy excessively because and i want you to talk about the amygdala hijack so that way our listeners know what that is but they can probably avoid a lot of these uh excessive force reviews which ultimately is going to save money from a liability standpoint. So we actually probably compare apples to apples. It's probably a lot cheaper to get your guys going on a program like this than to pay out more in, you know, workers comp claims on top of the lawsuits, the, the lawsuits that are going to come mm-hmm. to the city. Because right now law enforcement is one of the leading uh, professions right now that is always getting sued because it's one of the popular things to do. Oh, for sure. But if you can minimize sure. that through something like this, Man, it's a win-win, and so I'm going to throw a lot at you right now. I want you to, if you could, before, because I want to keep saying on the data, but define the amygdala, amygdala hijack for our listeners that don't know what that is. And two, this is a direct correlation of why we talk about it may not be the wisest thing to defund police because when you take money out of training budgets or whatever it is, that money could go towards programs like this, that which ultimately is going to continue to better the profession and reduce litigation, reduce liabilities, all sorts of things. So go ahead. I threw a lot at you, but man, this well, is yeah, good let stuff. Me, let me include, because the data really is driving all of this. Let me just tell you about suspect injuries and in all of this. First of all, they the taser deployment in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu population <laughs> is 23% lower yeah, than the sure. standard non-trained population. And when used... The taser deployment is used to stop a foot pursuit, not necessarily in in 85% of the cases where the BJJ group does use the taser, it's to stop a foot pursuit, not necessarily to deal with the altercation, the physical altercation when they turn and face you. So that's number two. Number three, regarding suspect injuries. Here's what we have. A 53% reduction in hospitalization to the suspect. Wow. Hmm. It's a 53% lower Mm. chance of hospitalization of the suspect when the suspect is engaged in a use of force interaction with a jujitsu trained officer, the 95. When they interact with the non-trained 50 uh, officers, there is more than twice the likelihood of going to the hospital to be cleared after the interaction. Mm. (laughs) And that's, that's, that, and that's hard data because they have it. They look, look, this is all the interactions. Here are the ones who claimed who needed to go to the hospital to be cleared. Here the ones who did not and they just looked at it jujitsu versus non so this right here when we talk about reducing the liability for the department the lawsuits the excessive force allegations you can imagine there's a correlation between excessive force lawsuits and hospitalization Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so when you cut the hospitalization in half presumably you cut the excessive force lawsuit uh, probability in half so this is what we're talking about when we talk about that now what's wild is you're talking about you know, you're talking about the reduction in terms of 
the actual uh, savings for the department, right? From a financial, where does the money come from? If we only talk about savings from the workers' comp, let's not even consider the lawsuit reduction because this makes it much, because lawsuit that never happened is hard to account yeah. for. Mm-hmm. Right, it's hard to quantify a yeah. lawsuit because it comes in it's twelve million dollars, or it doesn't happen at all. Yeah, if exactly. you haven't had one, you don't feel that pain if you haven't had one. But every department feels the pain of workers' comp Absolutely. payouts that could have been avoided. So the reduction by forty eight percent of workers' comp payouts, sixty seven thousand dollars in savings. Let's call that the actual gross savings for the department. When you deduct the training expense for this training which was $10 per class per officer. It's a drop-in program. And this is something that we offer at all Gracie University certified training centers around the world. We create a drop-in model so that the department's not paying for memberships that officers are not taking advantage of. So if you have 10 depart- officers in your mm-hmm. department and they each do 10 classes this month, that's 100 classes, 100 billable classes, boom, you're good to go. So 10 times 10, 100 times $10 per class, that's $1,000 for the month. Like that's the math. It's very simple. And we build the department at the end of the month. So they never pay for a class that wasn't taken. Mm -hmm. So do the math. 2,600 classes, uh, $26,000. That's 2,600 times 10 over the course of the two years. $26,000 invested. $67,000 in workers' comp gross savings. When you back out the expense of the training, your net savings for the department is over $40,000 on workers' comp expenses wow. alone. Alone, yeah. Yep. This is what's so crazy, you guys. Hey, can I be, on your, can I be on your sales team, Henner? Straight up, bro. <laughs> no, hey, no, hey. I, yo, we need to recruit hey, right now. That's hey, all we need is people to, let, because let me here's know. the deal. As we know, it's crazy, you guys. As we know, departments are stuck in 1980s and they're slow moving. Yeah. But yeah. what happened now, which is why it gets so excited they call it the energy what happened now is that (laughs) the data is so ridiculous from an officer injury reduction check that box 50 percent, 48 percent suspect injuries 53 percent reduction savings in workers comp 67 thousand gross 40 thousand net in a small window of time add that up over years and years and years we're talking millions of dollars saved because you have more healthy officers who get injured less frequently By interacting more safely, Mm -hmm. thereby avoiding that amygdala hijack. So from the financial – so the point is there's nothing to say no to anymore. Are you going to say no to reducing injuries to officers? Of course not. Are you going to say no to reducing injuries to the community, to civilians? If you do, you shouldn't be in policing because protect and serve, right, to preserve life is the highest oath for law enforcement. Preserve life. Mm-hmm. So if you aren't investing in your officer's ability to reduce injury and hospitalization to the community, you shouldn't be in policing. Yep. So you can't say no to that. And to the my financial savings, let's say you're greedy enough to say no to the rest. At least you'll say yes to the financial savings. The point mm-hmm. is we're attacking this now from all three prongs, officer safety, civilian safety, department and city savings. Mm-hmm. It's over. That's over. All we need to do now is educate. This is it. Once the world becomes aware of the data, there's nothing to say no to anymore. And, you know, I have a lot of like newer officers a- approach me from time to time and, you know, ask for like pieces of advice or whatnot. And one of the pieces of advice that I always pass on is don't become dependent on your belt. Mm. Meaning we have a lot of items on our belt that could cause a lot of damage, right? We have pepper spray, we've got batons, we've got sticks we can hit people with, we have firearms, you know, all sorts of stuff on our belt. Don't become too dependent on these items on your belt. And I can't imagine what the data will look like, like you said, by the end of the year or a year from when these recruits graduated and have been on the streets compared to how many times they've reached for items on their belt or just grabbed somebody and placed them on the ground and held them until backup came. Well, and and, that, and also on that note, AJ, one of the things that we've talked about before is officers not wanting to use their hands. And so That's like it, yeah. going to what AJ said is we become too over-reliant and dependent on the tools on our belt that when one of those tools lets you down, that amygdala hijack kicks in even more so because now it's almost like you go into freak out mode like, oh, shoot, like – what now? Like, what What yeah. do we do now? And so yeah. that last resort is I pull out my gun and then I use deadly force because now mm-hmm. I freaked out. So and that's what I want you to do, uh, Henry. I think you did this on the last episode, but just briefly explain to people what the amygdala hijack is 
because sure. I want people to know what that is when, as we talk about it and how it contributes to yeah, this is the officers brain in the field. Science. This is the brain science, and I'm not a brain scientist by any means, but this is the science <laughs> behind why jujitsu creates more composed, controlled, and compassionate officers in uses of force. When you are operating in an environment that you feel safe and comfortable and in control, you operate in what's called the prefrontal cortex, right? And this is a part of your brain that allows you to make rational decisions, if then considerations, right? If I do this, they will do that. So it's a very logical, it's your, it's your healthy processing part of your brain whenever you're comfortable and safe. When you lose control in a situation, straight up, I lost control. And and especially in a dangerous situation where your personal safety is now in jeopardy, when that happens, it triggers an amygdala hijack. The amygdala is the part of your brain that controls your fear response, your survival responses. You don't really get to choose your actions at that point. You just are on auto response based on the survival instincts that humans have and other creatures have on this planet. So the amygdala hijack happens when an actual or perceived loss of control in a dangerous situation for an officer. So what is dangerous and what, right? That's that's what it all boils down to. My perception of what is dangerous to me is different than what is dangerous for each of you. Mm -hmm. Like if you were to lay down and get someone on top of you who wanted to punch you in the face, for both of you guys, depending on your training level, that might be perceived as a dangerous, potentially life-threatening situation. If I were to lay down and have someone on top of me trying to punch me in the face, I would call that Tuesday morning jujitsu practice. (laughs) Let's just have breakfast when we're done. And we can hug and we can hug and smile and go have breakfast together because I'm going to not only am I going to neutralize you, I'm going to take care of you in the process. That's Mm. how non-threatening that is. So for me, I'm still in my PFC while either one of you or a less trained officer, you guys are all getting down already, but someone who has no jujitsu is completely loses their mind, draws their weapon, as we've seen so many times, fires a a, a shot around and kills the suspect in a situation where a more trained officer would have not even considered deadly force because it wasn't deadly to them. Mm -hmm. So it's all relative to every officer, which is why when I see an officer use lethal force, all I say to myself is, yep, it was lethal force because their life was in danger. Mine wouldn't have been but theirs was. So Mm -hmm. even though I don't think deadly force was necessary, if I was in that situation, I can't judge it because they weren't given the tools to have the confidence and safety that I would have had in the exact same situation. So I can't blame the officer. I blame the institution that fails Mm -hmm. to provide the training. And now that one institution has taken all the risk, all the rest of them have to do is follow their lead. And that's it. So all they have to do is say, okay, what do we need to do in each of these community law enforcement headquarters? What are we going to do to make this opportunity available? Like literally it's a race because every day that passes that an agency is not taking steps towards providing supplementary, regular weekly jujitsu practice is a day that a viral video can happen on that department's name or another excessive force lawsuit can happen on that officer's name and on the department's liability. So it's it's literally, this is the most exciting change to policing in the last 150 years in terms of use of force. This Absolutely. is the most exciting. And I know there are other problems that the, that the country needs to address, but in terms of the lowest hanging fruit, what's the most obvious thing we can do, the easiest, clearest path to reduce the level of force as rapidly as possible, but from every officer in a department, it's supplementary weekly jujitsu practice in partnership with a civilian owned, carefully vetted. That's the key in all of this. It has mm-hmm. to be the right school, carefully vetted civilian owned jujitsu school so that these officers can show up in regular classes because the attempt to create the same training opportunity in the department has proven faulty for several reasons. Number one, the cost to have an officer, two officers, let's say full time teaching classes all week long to accommodate everyone's off-duty schedules is unrealistic because you have two officers paying, let's just say, $70,000 a year. Now you got $150,000 expense annually to train mm-hmm. these officers yeah, that facility. it would have only costed you $26,000 to have them train at an off-duty um, you know, supplementary civilian-owned school because the civilian-owned school operates with hundreds of civilian students. The cops just come in to those already happening classes so they can offer it at a much lower price than what the department would have to pay to offer that same training. Not to mention, cop culture mm. always takes over in department training classes and courses. It's just this corrosive, profanity-laced, 
like you're a piece of trash and I'm the man and I'm your master. And there's such an attitude and ego in cop culture that it's so beneficial for the cops to leave that hierarchy and that corrosive cop culture in many cases and go to a civilian place where it's respect, humility, community learning. We're learning together. There's a master instructor, of course. But other than that, we're all wearing our white belts. There's no judgment. There's no, we're just who we are here learning together. There's a humility in that that cops can benefit from immensely, not to mention the community interaction benefit there. Henner is so spot on. It's like when he takes his jujitsu belt off, he puts on the duty belt and, and goes hop in a patrol car. Like, <laughs> I know. You are so spot on with that. But when you were sharing that story, I couldn't help but be reminded I used deadly force when I was a relatively newer officer. And once I came back to work, the academy staff brought me into the academy and they were like, hey, you know, can you tell us some things that you learned from this? You know, some teaching points that way we could go back, take what your experience that's new and that's all over the news right now to our recruits to teach them. And my response was it was just like a scenario, like like as soon as the threat appeared, I shut down. And like you said, I was on auto response. Okay, boom. I've been in this scenario before. Although it was a, a, um, a, a training ex experience, I knew what to do. And afterwards I was like, well, hey, that was just like a, a training scenario. And the likelihood that an officer is involved in a situation where they have to use deadly force compared to any other force is astronomically different. So yep. it's kind of mind blowing that we're not investing that same amount and quantity and quality of training into our normal use of force. You're as absolutely well. right. And, and the studies have shown too, like you said, officers are more likely to get into a use of force as not deadly force than mm -hmm. they are to get into a deadly force situation. And I know in from many different experiences it, while I've been working as a police officer that when I've been put up Again, when my back is up against the wall or I have to do something like first aid, they always say you're never going to rise to the occasion. You're always going to fall back to the level of your training. Well, if your training is crap, then what do you expect to fall back on? Crap. But if your training is pretty good, then you're going to fall back onto a place so that way you can think when that uh, amygdala hijack does kick in, you can still think and make the right decision. And so that's why what you're what you're saying right now, Henner, it, it, it's it's mind blowing to me. And uh, and like I said, I truly and I told you this before off camera, whatever I can do to be of service, uh, I, I believe in this and I, I don't like to get behind things that I don't believe in. I believe in this yeah. program. So that being said, if you if there's there's going to be a lot of people, a lot of police officers, police chiefs listening to this podcast and they're probably maybe watching this live right now. What, what's the first step for them? Because let's say they don't have a Henry Gracie studio within their city, because like you said, it's it comes down to vetting that program out for their guys. What's the first step for them to figure out, hey, man, we want to be a part of this program, but we don't have a Henry Gracie studio in the city or whatever. Where, how do we get started? Sure. Um, first of all, we've created a resource page on our website. It's gracieuniversity.com slash reform. Mm. Okay. That's the most important page for anyone to go to who is either, if you're a patrol officer, if you're a sergeant, you're a lieutenant, you're the deputy chief, the chief, I don't care where you are in the lineup. If you're hearing us right now and this resonates with you and you know your command staff need to be made aware of this, you can download the data at the gracieuniversity.com slash reform page. And you can watch my interview with Major King, the architect in Marietta. Like he explains it himself, the impact, the reason, the whole thing. And we created the opportunity for you to get into contact with Major King so that if you want to get out and you want to talk to the guy who actually did it, who I'm not law enforcement, right? I might sound like it sometimes, but I'm not. So you can talk to Major King and he can explain top to bottom. And he's doing that because he's so stoked with his results that like a lot of his time right now is being spent kind of um, uh, mentoring other departments in the same way so they can achieve the same success. And it's already happening. So we have, so, so that's happening. Regarding uh, departments who want to actually do this, finding the right school is the most important step in the process because jujitsu, this martial art, exists all over the world, highly popular, very effective martial art, but how it's taught in different schools will determine whether it's a safe partnership for a department. And there's two main considerations when we talk about BJJ concerns. Number one is the safety aspect. There are many schools that because the instructors were never certified in how to teach, Students will show up and on the first, second, third day, they're already sparring with other beginners, right? And this is just the general BJJ practice. They're sparring wildly, injuries happen right away. 
So having a situation where there's a structured beginner program where there isn't sparring for brand new beginners, it's a controlled curriculum driven learning environment is it couldn't be more important. Um, could it could not be overstated how important that is. The second aspect is jujitsu exists as a sport like like Taekwondo for Olympics and mm -hmm. judo and wrestling. These are great sports. So BJJ exists as a sport, but it also exists as this highly effective street self-defense proven system, right? We call it Gracie Jiu Jitsu here at, at Gracie University and at all of our certified training centers. So this self-defense street applicable version of Jiu Jitsu in many schools isn't even taught. So a student can go there who's a cop and learn techniques that are about points and weight classes and time limits and be training in this bubble of what the, the, the training objective is for years before they're ever told like, hey, and if the guy tries to punch you right here, Here's what you need to do. You could never learn that in BJJ. It's possible to train for years and never see that. So that's kind of the trap is that there's this generic name, BJJ, but the industry is completely unregulated, right? So oftentimes unsafe. And in many cases, 100% sport focused in the practice and teaching of the techniques. So those are the things that we have to watch out for, not to mention the instructors at each of these schools. Because it's an unregulated industry, it's not... It's not unheard of to have instructors at any martial arts school. I'm not just picking on BJJ. If it's unregulated, you can have instructors that are felons, that have sexual assault convictions or accusations. Like there's people who are not the best people in society who run these schools. So with Gracie University, what we've done is we have a certification process that a school that already exists can go through to learn the Gracie University way. And what is that? Safe beginner program, structured self-defense curriculum for beginners, um, background checks for every instructor. So although we aren't a government institution, we are a, a, a governing body when it comes to jujitsu and making sure that the in schools that we certify meet a quality standard that makes them the ideal partner for a police department, amongst other things, serving the community is yes, but particularly for the police departments, making it a certified Gracie Jiu-Jitsu training center makes it to where these curriculums that are going to be offered in a certain way, and they're going to have to meet this quality standard. And if they fall short on that, they lose their certification. So in territories, we have about 180 certified training centers throughout the U.S. and some international ones as well. Majority are here. In territories where there's already a certified training center, we can partner with the department right away. We can sign a deal, make that partnership happen, and guarantee the fixed drop-in pricing structure right? that is so successful for law enforcement agencies because they don't want to pay for what they're not using. So because they're all centrally partnered with Gracie University here in Los Angeles, we have the ability to really help influence that pricing structure nationwide. That's number one. Number two, if you're in a territory where there is no certified Gracie Jiu-Jitsu training center that is not listed on our website at gracieuniversity.com, what we do is we find the most suitable candidate in a territory. When the officer, when the department shows interest, we then survey the best candidates and say, look, Based on the schools that you have here, this is the one that we think is the most, the, the best raw location. And what we can do is now put them through this certification process so they can offer everything in accordance. So it's not like they have to be a Gracie University school to begin with, but by them going through the certification process, we can then say to the department, look, here's what you're going to get. Both pricing, quality, safety, it. structure, 100% dialed in. And here's the other thing in all of this. Sometimes the chief will go, well, who's Gracie University? to be the institution doing this. Well, Gracie University is the, is the, are the instructors, is the organization behind Gracie Survival Tactics, mm -hmm. GST. And GST is our law enforcement arrest and control instructor certification course for the last 20 plus years and is the one that is widely accepted as the preeminent jujitsu program for law enforcement DTAC instructors so we're already being trusted to certify all the instructors in law enforcement the one in department DTAC coordinators we're already the institution doing that in this case the the chiefs can be explained you can say listen chief this is the organization that already certifies our in-house dt instructors and now they're certifying the civilian school where our officers will go learn from and we already vetted their quality because they're California Post certified as an arrest and control institution, even though they're a private civilian organization, they're as vetted and as, as widely accepted from a jiu-jitsu perspective as any organization in the country. So it's not this unknown partnership. You're partnering with the organization. And then at the school that we certify, we also offer monthly GST classes for all the officers of that department. So let's imagine a situation where you have 100 officers coming to a certified training center. 
every month we offer br brush up GST classes only for those officers because they're not civilian classes now, only once a month. But they do civilian classes all month. But once a month, they get their special GST class where they learn the weapon retention, the arrest and control strategies, the uh, punch protection. When you have a duty belt that you have to consider throughout the equation. Mm -hmm. So there are many differences. And we're going to right. We're going to kind of trickle feed those throughout the year to the partnered agencies, officers and only certified training centers can do that because we certify their instructors on that GST program. So. It's and not to mention the video online access. So every officer in the agency gets online video access to all of GST. So they can watch the techniques even when they're not in class. They can log on to their mobile device and watch all their lessons. So it's a perfect partnership with the Gracie University Certified Training Center. And like I said, in, in agencies or in territories where there isn't a school that we've certified, we certify one. And once that certification takes place, the department can go in fully confident that it's the best possible partnership for them. So essentially nice. there really is no reason why uh, exactly. we shouldn't be getting involved <laughs> in this. So real, real quick, are there any questions um, that have come through on my, or your live? Uh, because I want to answer those before we, we let them in for sure. And while we're waiting for those questions to come through, like I said, it's graceuniversity.com slash reform. It has the data. It has the full, everything I just explained, the step-by-step -step process, all the benefits of a, of a school that you want to partner with as a police agency. And then you can contact us directly. You can contact Major King. Literally, if you're a police officer, all of your energy right now needs to be in making sure the command staff in your agency is aware. They may say no, but let's not let them be oblivious to the new data that has surfaced uh, justifying and substantiating the need for weekly practice. Like, this is what we've been calling for all along. I have beginner white belts who train one class a week, and after several months of practice, they're more confident in an altercation than a cop who's been on duty for 17 years and gets their four hours a year of training. <laughs> they do more in three months than a cop does in 17 years. If you just add up the numbers, that's what's so wild, you guys. This is what's <laughs> so... I've said it before very publicly. Police officers are the most undertrained professionals in America. Mm. There's no field of professional endeavor where you ask someone to do more with less training than when you ask a cop to physically apprehend a resistant, violent person with the one or two, three hours a year that they get with annual in-service training. And it's different in every state. There's no professional being asked to do more with less than police officers in America. And this is the sad tragedy. Yeah. And you're absolutely and that and that's one of the places where you have to change in law enforcement is we got to restructure and reprioritize things that are again causing liabilities and things like that. And so, you know, I've been saying this for a long time is, you know, that's why when that whole defund the police movement came around, I understood the concept of, you know, reallocation of funds. But if we're going to reallocate funds, if anything, we should reallocate funds more to training uh, in, in departments. I, I have gone and traveled over to all different departments across the country. And when I heard about some of their training and things like that or lack thereof or how officers are responsible for getting paying to get their own training. If you if you require an officer to pay for themselves to get training outside of their day job, the odds of them actually going out and doing that is slim to none. One, because right. some of these officers aren't paid that well. So some of these departments, I mean, they make ne next to nothing. And two, they already work 40 hours a week. It's a stressful job. And so if, if you are you know, uh, expecting them to go out there and do things on their own, uh, it's probably not going to happen. So I, I've always thought, man, we need to enter, um, we need to integrate this into our, our training. So that way it makes it more easier and accessible for officers to get this training. And therefore, like you said, I mean, the data is the data. I mean, you can't, you can't refute the numbers. And so if, for those that want to come out there and say, but this, but that, no, you can't really, refute the, you can't refute these numbers at all. So, uh, do we have any questions coming, Billy? Uh, yeah, we have one right now. Uh, what are your thoughts about departments that prohibit officers from using knee to belly or torso in fear of asphyxi asphyxiation, if I can pronounce that? Asphyxiation. asphyxiation. Yeah. So listen, and this is we, we can't go too deep down this because New York, New York is the example. And I don't know how versed you guys are in the New York situation, but they passed this bill. I, we call it the diaphragm bill, where if you touch the diaphragm of the subject, the officer, this is the Mayor de Blasio City Council disaster from last year. If an officer touches the suspect's diaphragm in the course of the arrest, intentionally or not, the officer can be held criminally liable, even if no injury was sustained by the suspect. 
What? So they banned the mount. They banned back mount. They banned neon belly. They banned literally all the safest and most controlled. Now, again, there are things in the bill that were justifiable, like no neck restraints. I'm, I've slowly transitioned to understanding the reason why neck restraints have to be banned. And we can go. I did a great 90 minute video on that. I won't waste too much time. <laughs> the point is, New York City passed a disastrous bill. In like, and in, in all of it, there was a piece that prevented you from touching the diaphragm. As a result, officers are now restricted from laying on someone's body in a controlling side control, mount control, the most basic positions. And because of that, an officer now has, you've essentially criminalized the least violent control options to officers in a ground control situation. And by criminalizing them, you are encouraging higher levels of force. So I call New York a disaster. And the defensive tactics coordinator, let me just be clear, the, the inside New York officers, because this wasn't made by New York PD. This yeah, was done by not. the city council and the mayor. It's the New people York that PD, aren't rolling around. <laughs> the number of messages I'm getting, you guys, from New York police officers who are saying, Henner, speak out louder and clearer because we can't speak out. We're the officers. We have to follow these new laws. You speak louder and speak harder because I can't tell you what a disaster this is. Like they're, t they're confiding in me with how bad it is. So I don't, I'm not saying anything bad about NYPD. I'm saying they're a lost cause right now until there's major leadership change on not even the department side in the, in the city administration mm -hmm. side until there's major leadership change. And we kind of, uh, we redact that bill or at least portions of it to make sure that cops can then lay on someone. They're a lost cause. So if you're in a department nationwide where they've also followed these diaphragm bill policies where, Oh, you can't put a knee on someone's chest or belly. You can't mount on someone to be honest. Like I'm not even part of that fight. Like you lost me. What you need to show them is this. If you can publish yeah. this in your neighborhood, go to your city council and start the process of undoing that legislation. It's much better than saying, Henner, can you show me a technique, a finger lock that I can use without touching their diaphragm? The answer is no. All that doesn't work. <laughs> There's nothing else. You need to be able to lay on another human's body if you want to reduce the level of force in your community. And just I'm so glad Marietta took that lead because now even though New York is a lost cause and any following agencies are equally lost, um, Marietta is fighting the other way. And here's what it boils down to you guys. This is what Major King said. He says, Henry, reform, police reform was always a PowerPoint when I was coming up to the ranks. Now, police reform is an inevitability. This yeah. is happening to yep. all law enforcement. And then I jumped in and I'm like, you're right, bro. Police reform, the way I look at it, it's like a wave. And what happens when a large wave, I was at the beach with my boys the other day, a large wave comes on the horizon and you're surfing, you're playing in the water. If you just stand there or you back away from it a little bit, you get pounded in the yeah. impact zone of the wave. What you need to do is paddle out to the wave as quickly as you can, get on your board and ride the wave and make it yours. Mm. Like I did yesterday a couple of times, not to brag, but I'm like a blue belt. <laughs> so I caught a couple of nice ones yesterday. So you have to ride the wave of police reform. Marietta is riding the wave of yeah, police exactly. reform. And guess what? Do you think that they're loving the board that they're on right now? Do you think they're loving this wave? It's, Marietta is a better department than they've ever been. And this was all spurred by the notion that reform was coming one way or another. No matter what, it's happening. The only question is, right, does it happen for you or does it happen to you? And every department is in a unique position right now. If you do not paddle out, get on your board and ride this way, preempt the reform with something reform worthy. If you don't preempt it, the reform wave will tumble you into oblivion. And then you're in New York's case where you're over there saying, Henry, please create some mm -hmm. techniques that'll save us now. And I'm like, you guys. Man, and, and, that, and that's an example of a knee jerk reaction. And that's what's sad. That's what happened, you know, post the George Floyd is there were all these knee jerk reactions to things that, you know, they weren't thought out. If we just, you know, get down to the nitty gritty of it, it wasn't thought out. You know what? Let's go out there and pass this bill so they can't do this. Well, it's like you're making a knee jerk reaction and not thinking it out. And the people that are making those decisions have never even been in a position to either a make a decision where their life was on the line or B they've never rolled around on the mats and therefore they don't know what control First holes or nothing like that are out. They just see it as a hey. here's the, in, in their defense though, Ryan, in their defense, what do we expect the councils to no, come you're, up with? You're absolutely right. Oh yeah. yeah. And, so, that, and so that's why we have to educate. That's why that's you and why I have, you have to educate. To go yep. first. Exactly. The point yep. is this for so long, law enforcement has done so little to get better. Like, let's just call it what it is. You're mm -hmm. the master at that. Yep. You have to call it. You have to call Absolutely. it what it is. Right? For so long, law enforcement has done so little 
to improve this dilemma, this use of force dilemma, because there was no accountability. They really could do whatever they wanted and get away with it. And all the institutional, right, structural situation that allows law enforcement to really be forgiven for anything on their watch, right? Like, really, it was really ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. Here's the way I look at it. Accountability for law enforcement. So law enforcement, wrongful use of force, excessive, whatever you want to call it, use of force has always been an issue, right? Mm -hmm. Since the 19, early 19, yep. whatever, as far back as you want. But let's just call it 1980s training practices, right? When it comes to actual tactics and training for officers, we were stuck in the 1980s training practices until the 90s, until the 2000s, 2010s. But in the 1980s, there was no accountability from a camera perspective. It was no mm -hmm. visibility. Yep, absolutely. A cop could do bad and no one would Boy, ever know. Nobody. Yep. What, and, and when I say bad, let's just be clear. I'm not saying all cops were bad people. I'm saying they used a wrongful use of force because of the amygdala hijack and they didn't have the training. So when a cop would do bad, meaning perform poorly based on the training they never received, a cop would do bad. There was no accountability because there was no visibility. So as visibility increased, and today every entity is captured on 17 different cameras by all these civilians and the dash cam and the body cam and the security cam over the top, but all of those cameras, accountability has skyrocketed but training tactics are still stuck in 1980s. Mm -hmm. So we are literally at the crossroads of an entirely new generation of accountability, but old, archaic, and useless training practices and mindset. We are sitting at the crossroads right now on this podcast in America. This is where we are. So okay. literally every single department has to one by one leave the 1980s and join the present day situation and what happens is the only way you solve this because public accountability is an all-time high officer training remains at an all-time low yeah, because it hasn't worse. changed and it's getting it's, worse it's getting, it's just what it, yeah it's getting yep. worse because it's obvious now so here you have accountability and here you have training and officer proficiency let's just call it what needs to happen is two things well there's only two ways to solve this one number one you lower public accountability you say hey public these cops aren't that well trained so be nice to them Let's just, you know, they sh you lower their expe expectation of officers straight up. <laughs> just ask them to expect less because cops don't know what the heck they're doing, right? That's one option is lower this. The other option is training increases and cops rise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. And cops rise to the level of training, you guys, that the public expects them to be at. Now, we can call the public overly ambitious in their expectation, or we can call the public reasonable to expect that if we're gonna send someone to do something, we should prepare them to do it. And what's crazy is that Marietta is finally training the officers at the expectation that pu the public has of those officers. Like people generally think cops are well-trained in hand-to-hand. -hand. These cops are well-trained in hand-to-hand. -hand. <laughs> yeah. The only ones who are not are the remaining 50. So in Marietta's case, the only work left to do is to make sure those remaining 50 get training does that make sense like you Absolutely. got 95 assets and you have 50 liabilities well now it's an obligation and now now it's coming mm -hmm. to a point now where you really have no choice but to go well, in the there and get is, changed the officers the, here's the problem ryan is that the officers do have a choice if this is off duty which it is to 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 mitigate certain concerns command staff concerns and to mitigate police presence concerns right like you support we need to have police force available on the streets so having them go on duty is a logistical nightmare if it's off duty we really can't make it mandatory. So the question is, how do you make every officer, the remaining 50 officers get on board in an agency where they can't be forced to do it? The answer is simple, incentivize, mm -hmm. incentivize. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you know what's wild is that you have agencies all over the country that they incentivize marksmanship, right? They may, this, is a mark, this is the expert marksmanship badge that goes on your uniform. When you're very good at firearms proficiency, you get this badge as a cop. And what else do they give? Pay bonuses, PTO bonuses, career point promotion considerations. So they give all these considerations for firearm proficiency, but yet we've created no incentive program to incentivize the off-duty training of the one skill to use these hands, to use these paws. To, oh, cool, more man. likely to reduce uses of force and officer injuries than any other single skill or practice. We're not incentivizing that. We're incentivizing the pulling of the trigger, which the, what are the odds that an officer pulls the trigger in their entire career? One out of a thousand that they pull yeah. the trigger. And yet we're making that the priority when it comes to 
pay bonus, time off, badges, uniform. Where's the jujitsu mm-hmm. proficiency uniform badge? Oh, it's coming. I already got it, you guys. <laughs> so the <problem> is this. <laughs> the department gets going with this. The only thing left is universal adoption for the department. But to do that, you got to create incentives that are so inviting that the officers go, wait a minute, you're telling me I can get an additional $20 per paycheck, $40 per month, you know, $400 per year, $500 per year. If I just go to jujitsu once a week, is that what you're going to pay for my gas for my whole year for jujitsu once a week? Of course I'm going to go. You see what I'm saying? You make it to where it's it's stupid not to go for the officers because it's such an inviting, incentivized program. Is there something in place for the officer that works for the chain of command that won't budge? And let me so let me let me, chief, let me repeat that question for you, AJ, or because you're not alive, so I'll repeat that question once you finish it, so they know what the question was. Yeah. So so is there something in place for the officer that works for the chief or city council or the mayor who refuses to approve something like this? Question was: Is there something in place for the chief, uh, command the officer. staff officer that won't budge when it comes to this program? Transfer. Oh, oh! I heard that. I heard, hey, hey, Henner ain't playing with him today. Hey. I heard that. Okay, hey. good answer, Henner. Man, this this was phenomenal, man. Like I said, I I appreciated our last conversation. Um, I can't tell you how much, and we've had multiple conversations now, and so I just really appreciate you. You're doing some phenomenal work. Um, like I said, I'm going to, I'm going to forward this to my captains, my chief, they need to hear it. I'm going to forward it to anybody I know in command staff, because especially now that the data is out, I know the first time we had a conversation, you are in the process of doing things, but when you have data and one thing I've learned in law enforcement, when it comes to the command level is, you know, there's a lot of good ideas, but we also need some hardcore facts and data to back those ideas up because the ones that ultimately make the decision are the ones that have the pocketbooks. And so if you can't justify with those people that have the pocketbooks, it's going to it's going to fall on deaf ears but now you have that data um and so you know I, I want to do whatever i can because not just for the sake of you know promoting what you have going on but for the sake of promoting our profession uh you said something that's critical is police reform is important and i've been telling this to people for a while now is that we have to get on ride this wave of police reform police reform is not a bad thing all reform is simply is doing things better trying to figure out new ways to do things and one of the biggest you know detriments to law enforcement is we are archaic in many ways in many many ways it's not just when it comes to use of force it's when it comes to community policing when it comes to intelligence we are very archaic and we don't know how to adapt to new times and so Mm -hmm. i'm glad that i'm on this this wave of police reform i'm glad that i'm on it with my brother henner with my boy aj and a lot of other people because once we get done I've, i've been saying this from day one my goal is to change the face of modern day policing and this is another way you change the face of modern day policing is by getting with the times and putting your officers in a position to win we need to put them in a position to win don't send them out to the streets where you know that at any given time they can either a be a liability or a or b they're going to take somebody's life unjustifiably or use excessive force just because they were ill-trained and so henner man um if you guys aren't following henner gracie please give them your uh your your um your, At your handle your handles and everything so that way they can follow you and uh and then also if there's any last uh encouraging words you'd like to leave with their audience that would be great thank you yeah you guys can follow me for sure at henner gracie on uh henner spelt with an r pronounced with an h one n uh henner gracie and uh listen you guys what i really want to wrap up with is just my gratitude to major jake king and the command staff at marietta police department like I could never do what they did. It doesn't matter how enthusiastic I am about this being part of the solution. As a civilian, I could never mandate this in law enforcement. And even though I've been fighting for it for 20 plus years, I could never mandate it. And I could never create the opportunity for this data to exist, right? You have 145 officers, 95 of which are doing supplementary weekly jujitsu. And this has resulted in 23% taser reduction, 48% officer injury. Uh, reduction department wide, zero injuries for the officers who are doing weekly jujitsu practice, 53% reduction in hospitalization to civilian suspects who interact with a jujitsu trained officer compared to their untrained counterpart, where you're more than twice as likely to go to the hospital when you interact with a non jujitsu officer there at Marietta Police Department. And they even have data that points to a 59% reduction in use of force at all. We didn't even Mm -hmm. talk about this yet, Mm -hmm. but I just wanted to point that out. The use of force, because the officer presence goes up, 
the officer confidence goes up. And as a result of a more confident, more present officer, they can talk a situation down because they remain calm, cool, and collected in the face of a heated exchange with the suspect. So for all these reasons, my gratitude, my most profound gratitude goes out to Marietta because because they're leading the way, because they took this risk and they now have aggregated the data, every other department in the country and even around the rest of the world has a model that they can follow to be successful at reducing injuries on both sides of the equation and ultimately saving money for the agency just in the form of workers' comp or saving $67,000 in an 18-month window, let alone for the rest of that department's history. And then when we talk about the savings when it comes to lawsuits and excessive force allegations, you guys, untold millions of dollars being saved that way. But we don't even have to consider those to know that this was a, a, the most worthwhile investment for, not for a department in terms of savings and betterment of the officers. Like you said, preparing them to go win. And in this case, win doesn't simply mean neutralize the threat. It means protecting the officer and protecting the civilian during that neutralization phase. So for any agency out there who's even remotely interested in learning more about this process and what the data is and downloading the actual data, you can do all of that at gracieuniversity.com slash reform. You can get in touch with Major King. And like I said, if you're in an agency where you present this data to your command staff and they don't take action or take notice or at least start taking steps in the direction of implementing something like this. And again, we're here to help however we can. If they don't do that, you have to question the leadership, the whole mm -hmm. thing. You have to question everything about the agency because there is nothing to say no to. Financial savings, officer safety, civilian safety. If something checks all three of those boxes and anyone in the chain of command is saying that we should not explore this, there are other motives at hand and they're not the right motives. And when I say transfer, I'm not saying that jokingly. I'm saying you're in the wrong organization. You've got you don't want to be part of an organization that isn't trying to police in a way that you think is best, meaning prepare the officers, protect the civilians. If they're not doing those two things and they're not doing it in the best way they can. Now, if this information wasn't available, then a department can say, oh, we never knew. But the, 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 the availability of this data now and the, the visibility of this system and these programs now, if you don't do it, that's deliberate indifference. That's negligence. That's negligence. You are now liable. And if an officer in a department where they neglect to enact a program like this, if an officer in that department uses excessive force because they were only get four hours a year of training, to me, that's now the department is liable, should be held liable because they knew the program existed and they knew the data was promising, but yet they failed to take action. That's my position on that. And it, and it will happen, man. I saw I saw a headline the other day that said, I guess, uh, uh, the family of an officer is actually suing the city and the department for the failure to uh, put him in a position to basically make it home. I guess he responded to a call for service and, uh, you know, he didn't have a backing officer or something like that. And so he ended up uh, dying. I don't know if it was a shooting or what, but the reason I bring that up is because that's a prime example of how, you know, you will continue to be held liable if you have in fact, knew of other ways that could, could potentially keep your officers and the, and the community safe. So, Henry, man, you're phenomenal, bro. I appreciate you. AJ, as always, I appreciate you. As always, um, brother. You know, do we I, have a one has to go? Do you have one? I don't have one, man. All right. Hey, Henry, really fast. To end every podcast, we, we play a game called One Has to Go. We'll make it quick. So, one has to go. Whatever you pick, everything associated with it goes as well. We'll do football, basketball, martial arts or golf out whoa hold on I, so let me let me repeat that for everybody that's watching so <laughs> one has to go you said football basketball martial arts or golf yep can we throw baseball in there no <laughs> no nope, that's the four that's the four mine is golf see ya nah basketball gotta go oh no not basketball oh. football basketball golf. golf gotta go yeah golf gotta go basketball, billy what you got basketball for us? gotta go for me golf Oh. Golf, okay. Hey, Golf. forget all y'all. Basketball got to go. Basketball got to go. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, this was a phenomenal episode, Henry. I, I, can't, I can't thank you enough. Uh, I'm going to – you're close enough. You're driving distance, man. I want to I wanna ha want you to come to have a meeting with my command staff as well, personally, if you're open to that. Man, I want to see you beat um, up Ryan, so I just, I'll pay for that. Why, I just bro? See that why? I'm not even <laughs> – just we can do both in the same trip. No, there you go. Sure. If, if, Ryan, once you pass the data up the ladder there, Ryan, and if you're if if, if it gets real to where the command staff is like, yo, this is we want to action oh, no, on this. For sure. 
then I'll be glad. That's kind of how this process even, works. Yep. I wouldn't even get. I wouldn't yeah. even bring you in until we got to that point of there would be some serious talk. And just for listeners out there, what will happen is you pass the data up the ladder, you get certain approvals. When you're at the deputy chief, the chief's level, and they go, listen, we love this idea. You know, can we talk to Henner? I set up, and this is for any agency, not just Ryan, but any agency out there. I'm, I'm going to get on a Zoom. I'm going to speak to him. If we got to bring Major King on the call on the Zoom, he will talk on the call with the chief. So, like, this is all hands on deck, like, because we know that once a department makes this change, they're good to go. We yeah. can move on to the next one. Like, we're good yeah. to go. We're out. We're good to go. We're good. So, like, it's literally saving lives now, not just officers, but civilians. So, this is top priority for me right now. So, anyone in any, any department in the country who wants to, you know, bring us up the ladder and then get my involvement at any stage or at the stage once it's final approval level to just have that final nudge and clarity and for them to feel safe. Because, you know, that command staff is going to want to hear from the people who are going to facilitate this, right? And if we're going to be partnering with your agency, they want to hear from the person who's responsible for that quality. So I know the importance of that discussion and I'm open to having that at any stage. Now, I want to be like that State Farm commercial. Like, nah, I got the preferential treatment. Everybody else, y'all deal with somebody else lower. <laughs> I got Henner. <laughs> so, Tell uh, your chief that. Tell your chief that. <laughs> All right. But yeah, so uh, man, we'll definitely talk more. I, I, I'm, I, I can't see what this, I can't wait to see where this goes. No, in my department, man, we're always on the cutting edge and front edge, uh, a front end of things, man. So I'm sure we'll have some conversations there, especially now with the data, man. So hey, man, tell your wife and your family, man. I say God bless them, love them, and uh, can't wait to link up soon. I, I know coronavirus is dying out a little bit, so it'll uh, be good to come out your way and then uh, have AJ come out here and move to California where the the weather is good. I don't know about moving. I come visit. I ain't moving out there. I don't there, know why so. you want. <laughs> stay out there where it's frozen all the time so the ground don't shake out here the ground don't <laughs> shake so hey well Henner man thanks again I always appreciate you brother AJ I'll get with you guys later but anyways we will see you guys next week alright guys thank you good one yep